Good afternoon. My name is Kathleen Cummings. I'm the director of the Kushwa Center for the Study of American Catholicism and a faculty member in the Department of History and American Studies. And I'm absolutely delighted, along with my colleague Patrick Griffin, the chair of the History Department, to welcome you to this event this afternoon in honor of our beloved colleague, um, Tom Kesselman, um, on the occasion to celebrate the occasion of his retirement, um, which is not as much a celebration as a mourning. I know that there are many ways that I have appreciated Tom. Uh, first of all, as a colleague, when I joined the Notre Dame faculty in 2001, he was acting chair and was so welcoming and so encouraging to me. Um, certainly as a scholar, his work in religious history has been inspirational and so instructive not only in terms of content but also in terms of method and I've learned a lot from him. He's been the past president of the American Catholic Historical Association which is our primary guild and grateful to him uh, for that. I think primarily though it's as director of the Kushwa Center that um, I'm exceedingly grateful to Tom and uh, I hope he doesn't go too far in his retirement. Tom served on our advisory board since its creation in 2002, and he was instrumental in helping the Kushwa Center expand beyond the United States and particularly develop relationships with our French colleagues. Um, but without question, uh, the thing I valued most as the director of the Kushwa Center, um, you know, when you moderate events, and I've moderated a lot of events over the years, and you know, some are very good, and some are not so good, and some speakers are a little boring, and some are a little too provocative. And there's always a moment when you get to the question and answer period, and you feel this trepidation, like, how is this going to go? And you're not sure it's going to go all that well. And then you look out in the audience, and you see Tom Kesselman has his hand up. And you think, it's going to be fine. And in so I, you call on him right away, and no matter what the subject is, he's able to come up, and you all know this, those of you who have seen him um, in lectures, he's able to come up with the most penetrating question to illuminate something that maybe people hadn't thought of, and next thing you know, the discussion is off and running, and really, uh, it's, it's one of the most, um, the, the things I've treasured most about having you as a colleague. So there will be a lot of ways to celebrate Tom today. We'll hear from a lot of different perspectives. Now I'm going to turn things over to Patrick, and he'll chair our first session. Thanks, Kathy. Um, I want to share just a little story about Tom. There's going to be lots of stories, I'm sure, over the course of the day. But this is one that I think kind of really gets to the heart of who he is. And you had nothing to do with this, Tom, so you're not going to be embarrassed by it. So it's right after John Coleman was named as the new chair. So we sit in the office together. We had just gone through a faculty meeting. It wasn't the most enjoyable meeting, as most of our faculty meetings usually are. And we look at each other, and then he just sighs. And he said, what are we going to do next year without Tom Kesselman? <laughs> and I knew exactly what he meant. And um, as a chair, you really do value certain colleagues. Well, you value all your colleagues like you do your children, but you love them differently like you, like you love your children a little bit differently. And, and Tom has consistently been that one person who is the center and the heart of the department. Like Kathy was saying, he could always be counted on to kind of ask that question because it was, it was always an icebreaker. And that was a way of him of, of kind of being a part of the community. But at faculty meetings especially is when you saw what Tom Kesselman really was and really is. He had a unique ability to understand the gist of what was going on and to be able to sum it up what people were trying to articulate but couldn't quite get there. He also had an uncanny ability to understand the tensions of the department. And he could diffuse these tensions quite easily just with his easy manner and his rational way of doing things. Now, some people could say that he may do this because he liked to hear his own voice. Maybe there may be a little bit of truth in there. Yeah, exactly. But he really did it because I think Tom struck everybody, and I think he does strike everybody, as being a person who's extraordinarily wise, um, wise beyond his years. But more importantly, he's also somebody who's amazingly charitable. He has the ability to reach people and to touch people and to understand people and to meet them where they are. And he has done that consistently as a colleague for all the time that I have known him. I've cherished my time with him as a chair. Numerous times he will not, I, I would just call him up and say, Tom, I got to talk to you. <laughs> you know, what do I do? How do I get myself out of this one? And he would always have sage advice, and that advice came because of his charitable streak and because of his wisdom. So the thought that we are talking about him right now as a mentor and as a colleague, I think that's a remarkable place to start. 
Because when we think of Tom, certainly in the history department, we think of him as being not only a colleague, but a model colleague, the model colleague. So I'm delighted here to welcome everybody for this first panel, and we're going to hear from two of Tom's graduate students. The first is going to be Jamie Deming, um, who finished with Tom back in 1989. Okay, the dissertation was entitled Protestantism and Society in France, Revivalism, and the French Reformed Church in the Department of the Guard, 1815 to 1858. He joins us from Princeton Theological Seminary. After Jamie, we're going to hear from Sammy Zaka, who finished in 2006. The title of his dissertation was Education and Civilization in the Third Republic, the University of San Joseph, 1875 to 1914, and he joins us from Rock Valley College. Please uh, join me in welcoming Jamie to the podium. Jamie. Okay, the, I wrote these down because it could be too easy to get carried away just by telling stories because there's no shortage of them. Um, my path to being Tom Kasselman's first PhD student was fittingly unconventional. As my wife tells a story, and I should say, I don't remember this, so if it's not true, it's her fault. Uh, as my wife tells the story, and it's in a tone that kind of indicates questionable approval, I became a French historian because of a decision Tom made when he was 12 years old. (laughs) She bases this on a story she says Tom told in one of his rare moments of self-confession. Apparently, when the nuns told him to choose a foreign language to learn, he said the Spanish teacher was an old hag, the German teacher was a Nazi, but the French teacher was a pleasant, mild-mannered woman, so he chose French. The story continues that when Tom began graduate studies at Michigan, French was the only language he really knew. So they kept assigning him French stuff, and that's his technical term, French stuff, until the logical thing to do was to specialize in French history. When I came to Notre Dame in 1983, I intended to study colonial early republic America. I was told, however, that the early Americanists had taken an administrative position and would no longer be teaching and that there was no one to replace him. I I might add that it took three years to replace him, and there were so many many, um, candidate lectures that I think we should all get a minor field in American early republic. It it just seemed to go on endlessly. At something of a loss for which direction to go, I enrolled in the pro seminar in early modern Europe the hazing course that introduced new graduate students to the literature of pre-French revolutionary Europe. Here I encountered Tom Kasselman, a young, not always restrained, almost tenured professor of modern French history. For his part, Tom was only there, Tom was only teaching the course because the professor scheduled to do so was unable to due to illness. In this course, Tom introduced us to the work of historians like Natalie Davis, Pierre Goubert, Lois Ladry, and Lawrence Stone. Coming out of an undergraduate program that was traditional in its historiography, I was quite taken by their fresh, new approach to historical studies known as social history. At the end of the, at the, end of the term, Tom complimented my work and said I was welcome to take more courses from him in the future. I took him at his word and told my wife I was going to be a French historian and would have to go to France to do research for a year. I got about the same look as when I told her I wanted to quit my job and do a PhD. And then Tom went on sabbatical and stayed on for a second year to oversee Notre Dame's study abroad program in Angers. I I think I only took two courses from you. (laughs) It was a decision neither of us have ever regretted. Well, neither my, my wife, Christy, and I, I'm not going to, Tom may have regretted it, <laughs> that neither of us ever regretted, not so much for the subject of 19th century French history as the opportunity to work with Tom and Claudia. It is difficult to express the level of care, commitment, and geni- generosity with which they assume the role of mentors. As his first student, Tom may not have known how to demand or expect deference. It's more likely he just didn't care. He and Claudia were generous beyond any reasonable expectation. 
though I have never dared ask about Claudia's initial reaction when Tom invited his graduate student on their family vacation. I, I, who, who does that? <laughs> With 10 or 12 months alone doing research ahead of me, the trip from Angers to the south of France, maneuvering the roads of Provence in a minivan along roads never intended for something that size, staying in a French vacation camp, in a, and not to mention a number of random wanderings through graveyards, was an invaluable introduction to the country and culture for someone with little international experience. The research that followed ended when I quickly returned to the US for an on-campus job interview. Tom had seen an advertisement for a position at a school he thought might, uh, might interest me, and then passed it on to my wife, Christy, and then guided her as she wrote and compiled and submitted the application, not me. I guess, which I think would make you her mentee as well in this case. It, uh, it was unorthodox, but as I got the position, it proved more than, more than effective, more effective than the applications I had completed myself. The reasons I ended up writing on French Protestantism are a different story that does not involve Tom. Tom cautioned me that he was no expert in the subject, but still took it on. A pattern, if you look at the work of other of his students, where all is Pretty, where he, he seems to have a difficulty getting graduate students who work in a specialization. Through many conversations, questions, observations, nods at appropriate time, a question at an appropriate time, a comment that seemed to be correct, Tom was, showed his skill and insight as an advisor. He was not one to allow dissertations to leisurely develop. Perhaps knowing the task was being covered by someone else, I don't remember him ever threatening me about finishing the project. The speed, however, with which he read drafts and returned comments, along with casual mentioning of pending deadlines, provided enough guilt to hasten the writing along. This could have had something to do with the debilitating coffee addiction I developed in the race to finish. The mentoring did not end with a dissertation defense. He provided encouragement and guidance in the job market, including going on sabbatical for a year so I could fill in as his replacement. Four years out, it was he who saw the advertisement for my current position, noting how it seemed to fit my interests and skills, skills he had developed. After this, he willingly read drafts and offered direction as my dissertation transitioned into a book thereby doing as much as anyone to guide me through the tenure process. I want to finish, however, by noting the intangibles, in particular the more relational than, those that are more relational than academic. There have been many dinners with Tom and Claudia at which much of the time academics and academia were thankfully not a part. The willingness to include Christie as an equal, see academic topics not a part, uh, at, these, at these functions, their visit a few days after our daughter was born, who Tom promptly declared a Gerber baby. I, though in fairness, my daughter did come out rather hefty. And then there are the stories, the humor, and infectious conversations. All of these things that, are, that forge friendships beyond mentorship. Thank you, Tom. Hello, am I on? Uh, Sammy Zaka, I uh, spent seven years with uh, Tom, starting in 1999 and finishing in 2006. Uh, I, uh, I taught for a couple years and now work for the, uh, just a bit about myself, work for the uh, State Department as a foreign service officer. But I'm a diplomat. Uh, I was in Côte d'Ivoire last week, I'll be in Chad uh, next week. Uh, my goal with these uh, comments will be to offer vignettes about uh, Tom's impact, impact on my life <clears throat> and career. I'm going to keep this uh, uh, portion of the uh, 
of the event team. So uh, there will be plenty of time for uh, Q&A, uh, for more details, uh, if you wish, during the Q&A session or uh, probably, preferably offline. Um, I was thrilled uh, to be asked to be a part of this panel. Uh, Tom's biggest impact on me, uh, the thing I used in my own uh, mentorship in my own life, was uh, um, the human aspect of our, uh, of our relationship. So the first thing I'll highlight about Tom was uh, about Tom as a mentor was his uh, patience. Uh, I arrived at Notre Dame. I was a couple days shy of my 22-year-old uh, my 22-year-old birthday. I was looking for fun. I was used to the Southern California lifestyle. Uh, <laughs> uh, I was cocky in some things, uh, insecure in others. Um, Tom always remained patient with me, even while helping me to continue to mature, which took a few years, no easy task, uh, I can tell you. Uh, we can discuss the embarrassing conversations uh, I had to have with Tom uh, offline, <laughs> maybe. Uh, kindness, the second thing I'll say is kindness. Never a cross word, always looking to build, always constructive. I remember the first paper I wrote uh, for Tom in my first year. It was on the White Fathers in uh, La Vigerie. Uh, his uh, one-page typed handwritten response to the uh, paper said something like, uh, well, I think I could probably even quote it. Uh, Your argument does seem to surface from time to time. Uh, <laughs> OK, Tom, point taken. Uh, I did better, I think, uh, from that point on. At least I tried to. Uh, the third thing I'll highlight about Tom was his uh, um, engagement, thoroughness as a mentor and colleague. Uh, he really took the time to provide feedback that was useful and practical. Uh, he made sure uh, his students were well prepared for panels, job talks. He copy edited uh, chapters, honed arguments. Uh, I'll give you one example of that. I spent a lot of time in France uh, doing archival research, uh, mostly most of my fourth year. Uh, compiled a very large set of primary source uh, documents, documents that are in my garage. My wife wants them out. Uh, uh, mostly from the French Foreign Ministry and Jesuit archives. Lots of great material, but almost uh, too much, in fact, uh, too much material. And I can just couldn't wrap my, hand, my head around it. Talked to Tom about the uh, material. Uh, he thought about it. And um, uh, and proposed, proposed a working argument that would organize my thoughts, and did, uh, in fact, organize my thoughts. You can find that argument in my dissertation, because uh, it never changed. Uh, Tom had been thinking sort of about that argument, and it uh, uh, evolved maybe a little bit, but never, uh, never changed. And uh, the last thing I'll highlight was Tom's uh, selflessness, loyalty. Tom always kept in contact uh, with me, uh, shown, shown interest in my life, beyond academia, supported my decision to leave academia, uh, never betrayed an annoyance or regret in having trained someone who added nothing to his academic legacy. Uh, that's, there's a reason I'm on this panel. <laughs> Uh, so, uh, so uh, you know, I really thank Tom uh, for that. Uh, then I'll conclude by saying that, uh, as you know, it was a good seven years, but Tom's uh, mentorship spoiled me. I've had many would-be mentors uh, since I've left Notre Dame, and unfortunately for them, I keep comparing him to the Tom uh, template. Uh, some have, none have fully measured up, some not even a little bit. Uh, in my own mentorship, when I want to give up on someone, when I want to reject a cable because it was poorly written, uh, not well thought out, not well researched, uh, when I want to shake someone, you know, to uh, wake up, uh, I, I try to remember Tom and how he sort of handled me. I say try because I don't have that kind of patience. But uh, anyway, great model, uh, great model for me. Uh, I'll close by saying that comparing others to Tom is always going to be unfair. I think of Tom as a second father figure, uh, and that's the highest sort of praise I can give him. The, the 
first panel focused on, we had, um, unfortunately, some of Tom's students uh, who were supposed to be here and one who was supposed to be here through Skype had a dropout. So we're going to go right to the second topic, which is on Tom's scholarly legacy, and invite two more students to the panel. And then we'll have a question and answer session uh, at the end of that. So I'd like to welcome, I, are there enough chairs? Can you stay up there? Probably not. Uh, <laughs> um, Mike Clinton. And I'd like to thank Mike for being um, really helping us organize this. He was the one that was in charge in, of, of rounding up all the students. So um, we're grateful to him. Mike received his PhD from Notre Dame in 1998 on the French peace movement, 1821 to 1919. And he teaches at Gwinnett Mercy University in Philadelphia. The second panelist is Andrew Orr, um, who received his PhD in 2007 writing on the mental Maginot line, anti-republicanism, gender, and voting rights in the politics of the French army, 1871 to 1940. So I'll turn it over to Mike now, thank you. Thanks, Kathy. Uh, Kathy comes from uh, a part of the world uh, where everybody speaks like me, but somehow, uh, how many years in Indiana managed to scrub it out of you, I suppose, it's at some point. So uh, uh, when the theme for this panel eventually came into focus, I knew immediately that I wanted to take the opportunity to revisit Tom's second monograph published in 1993, Death in the Afterlife in Modern France, and my motives for doing so are basically self-referential, pretty much, you know, my motives for everything are self-referential. Uh, beginning with the very petty fact that it's the first published academic work in which my name appeared. Uh, in the acknowledgments, alongside some fellow former graduate students, you don't need to know who they are, uh, from the early 1990s, who took a seminar that Tom had offered as he was completing the manuscript. Uh, another motive has to do with a habit that I've adopted over the past few years of rereading books that I had encountered long in the past to gauge how the impressions and memories I, uh, uh, I had of them in my less mature years compare with my reactions in this uh, riper and bolder and pudgier stage of life. Um, each time that I've read Death in the Afterlife in Modern France has been framed by different circumstances that affected the way that I processed the book. The first time, Tom assigned uh, those of us enrolled in his seminar select chapters for discussion and feedback. That is, he forced parts of the manuscript on us. Uh, actually, it was a generous gesture uh, to share with some apprentice historians a substantial and significant work in progress to which Tom had by then devoted several years of his life, although now I realize he was off on vacation with Jamie for a good deal of that. Uh, Tom described our comments as shrewd uh, in the book's acknowledgments, which based on my well-established fluency in the Kesselmanese dialects, Roughly translates to mean that we were smart not to jeopardize our grades with any critiques so severe as to cause him to change anything this late in the process. <laughs> My first reading of Tom's book was only partial, but not long after that I read the entire manuscript from front to back and top to bottom when Tom threw a much appreciated and chronically needed hundred dollars my way to proofread the galleys, it might have been 200, it might be low bond. Uh, that reading was also partial in that I focused mostly on spelling, grammar, and other basic features of the text itself. Over the intervening 25 years, I've never actually had the occasion to read the book published in its final form, right? Did everybody remember to bring their copies, <laughs> right? Uh, uh, despite having picked up uh, my own copy nearly that long ago. So this book has been sitting on my shelf all that time and only now have I taken it down to read it as it was meant to be read. Uh, and right off I noticed something that I had, uh, that had escaped me the last time that I read through it. It is riddled with spelling, grammar, and other basic <laughs> errors. Um, for those of you who haven't read 
death in the afterlife in, in modern France once, let alone three or really, I guess, two and a half times, uh, it raises the dead as a central concern over which the contentious French struggled in one of the most contentious periods of history, from the revolutionary period through the early 20th century, when the momentous changes that reshaped life here below had equally momentous repercussions in the world hereafter. The range of evidence that Tom considers in analyzing how death and its meaning shifted over the course of a century or more required an impressively diverse variety of interpretive approaches that led him to places where most of us would rather not go. Cemeteries, funeral pr processions, demography. Uh, I'll talk about more about those first two and some other areas in a moment, but I want to spend just a, uh, a few uh, comments on the book's opening chapter on progress and anxiety in French demography, a title that expresses a mixture of feelings that Tom likely felt as he was writing that chapter in particular. Uh, in preparing my comments today, I did some research by looking up reviews written about death in the afterlife when it was published, a method we were encouraged to practice in our colloquia uh, to find reviews about the books we are assigned, written by more knowledgeable and competent historians, then regurgitate them uh, in our own critiques as if they were our own, uh, which I think, I, I think I described that process correctly. Now, all of the reviews that I retrieved were positive, which is a qualifier necessary to make clear because um, I'm going to mention a point of criticism offered by Alan Mitchell in the European History Quarterly that pertains to Tom's chapter on demography. I, I knew it, I knew. This has been eating you for 20 something years. I'm here to free you, Tom. So Mitchell found Tom's coverage of the, to of the topic cryptic, if only he were fluent in Kisselmanese, and concluded that he forfeits an opportunity to make a serious contribution to recent discussions about the depopulation crisis of late 19th century France or the so-called medicalization of French society. I find this criticism, as Tom might call it, idiosyncratic, given that never in my life would it occur to me that someone in full control of his mental faculties might call for more on the demography stuff. <laughs> it's also a bit unfair because in that chapter, Tom lucidly establishes a point that meshes cogently with what I regard as one of the distinctive contributions that Tom's perspective brings to our understanding of the complexities involved in the confrontation between religious belief and practice and the values of the modern world, much as he did in his first book on miracles and prophecies in 19th century France. Demography as a professional field of rational inquiry reflected the enlightenment assumption perpetuated through the 19th century in the positivist worldview that more information, more knowledge about worldly phenomena would somehow provide people with a sense of reassurance and confidence, and specifically with regard to death, would make its meaning more transparent. Tom shows that this assumption is far from true, and that the detached and rational quantification of death expressed in demographic statistics can be unsettling rather than reassuring. Uh, I'm reminded of that quote ascribed variously to French generals from the First World War or uh, sometimes to Joseph Stalin that when one person dies, that's a tragedy. When a million people die, that's statistics. Existing cultures of death hadn't equipped people to respond to its impersonal demographic magnitude. With all due respect to Alan Mitchell, whose work I've used profitably, what Tom does quite effectively in this chapter is establish the rationale for his concentration on culture in its manifold dimensions that evolved to mediate people's encounters with death. Although demographic data can be understood as a useful context for the study of changes in the cult of the dead, Tom wrote, culture can also become a context that informs demographic changes. Elsewhere in that chapter, Tom observed that demography provided not only data, but also a new discourse for interpreting mortality. The most striking realization that occurred to me in this recent rereading of Death and the Afterlife in Modern France is Tom's methodological versatility, interpreting not only this demographic discourse, but multiple other discourses throughout the entire work, or as Michel Legree put it in his review that appeared in the Journal of Modern History, 
bringing detailed and elaborate analysis to areas heretofore hardly explored. In various chapters, Tom displays his fluency in folklore, relating tales about Godfather death and others like it, and deconstructing them with sensitivity towards their role as tools for understanding and consolation. He disinters sermons from local archives to show how their tone moderated over the 19th century, from the fire and brimstone messages more typical at the beginning to softer, more compassionate images of reunions with, with loved ones that projected the domestic ideal into eternity by the end of the century. He wanders through cemeteries to explain the restructuring of the geography of relations between the living and the dead, and presents several of his own photographs of tombs that Mitchell acknowledged testified to Tom's keen eye for the unique French blend of custom and commercialization. He brings readers into the seance parlors where Victor Hugo and others struggled over their skepticism and their desire to believe. He analyzes the key pieces of legislation that sought to address the question in its spiritual and physical senses, where do the dead go? And he somehow brings to life the story of the emergence of the commercial funerary, funeral industry, the pompe funèbre, as a tale of drama, intrigue, and impassioned conflicts. His ability to bring such different sources into a coherent conversation with each other, whether philosophical treaties, treatises on spiritualism and Swedenborgianism, prayer cards and other exemplars of popular iconography, the literary fiction of Henri de Balzac, Camille Flammarion, and others, the regulatory measures of municipal councils, the correspondence of parish priests, the marketing materials of funeral directors, and yes, statistics is an impressive feat that I don't believe I appreciate it so well as an apprentice historian, but is so brilliantly obvious to me now that I more un fully understand how difficult even a more conventional and straightforward research process can be. The book culminates with an epilogue analyzing Gustave Courbet's monumental painting, Burial at Ornan. The chapter is short but insightful, much like Tom himself, and <laughs> As it was when I first read it, my favorite part of the book, it's only after reading what Tom has explained throughout the book that we can really appreciate the cultural tension and movement in a scene that to the un uninitiated may appear to depict little more than a group of uninteresting people standing around a hole. Every time that I visit the, visit the Musée d'Orsay in Paris, where the painting is on display, I spend part of my time taking it in, and I don't know how you feel, about this, uh, thinking ab about Tom, <laughs> and <laughs> not in that way, and how he helped me to see something. As a scholar, Tom speaks in an idiom that is uniquely his own, which is the highest praise that I have to offer. Um, yes, it's a distinct idiom, yet it's a distinct idiom that blends with the commentaries of other scholars, most prominently Philippe Ariès and Michel Vavel, but also including T.J. Clark, John McManners, and many others in this book. I mention this in part because it prompted me to think about something that perhaps we'll have the chance to discuss further in the Q&A portion of this session, and that is Tom in his role as the scholarly interlocutor, which uh, Kathy has already alluded to, um, which comes through in his book and in his other writings in a measured way appropriate to the tone of written academic work, but which doesn't convey at all the buoyant enthusiasm that Tom projects when discussing ideas in person. And actually, we had uh, exactly that kind of experience today over, over uh, lunch. Tom gets animated when engaged with ideas, sitting on the edge of his seat, moving his arms, around, <laughs> modulating his tone to express excitement and even wonder or skepticism. Wow, <laughs> right? <sighs> I don't know about that, Michael. Um, in a way that simply can't be contained within the flat pages of, of a book. Uh, let me end by acknowledging the generous spirit that pervades the, the book, and the gen which uh, reflects the overall generosity of Tom's spirit himself, as well as, as, as Claudia. I've had many of those meals and evenings of good company and, uh, uh, and expressions of concern uh, and advice as well from both Tom and Claudia. 
Uh, he doesn't share most, perhaps, any of the beliefs that he describes people in his book embracing as they navigate it through the emotional stages that accompanied the death of someone close to them. But he does believe in the reality and validity, validity of those emotions and people's desire to affix meaning and life to death. It is a sympathetic and humane study that explains and analyzes without condescension. When my mother died a few years ago, it felt to me to organize the funeral arrangements and the other matters that followed her death. Before the funeral mass, in the back of the church, I got into an argument with the parish pastor who refused to allow the chaplain from my university to can celebrate my mother's funeral mass until he had provided sufficient confirmation from his provincial, Father John was a redemptorist, regarding his credentials, a requirement that the pastor passed uh, off on an order circulated by his bishop. As you, bishop, as you can tell, I, I'm over it now. <laughs> the issue was resolved after my cousin diplomatically intervened after seeing me very nearly digitally jabbing my point into the chest of the priest who was about to bury my mother. <laughs> as I read Tom's book, I identified with many of the grieving family members he wrote about who came into conflict with priests, bureaucrats, funeral per, uh, directors, and others perceived as frustrating their rights to bid farewell to their deceased uh, loved ones in the manner they wanted. And so one of Tom's achievements in this book, and I'll end with this thought, and in his other works as well, is that he enables that kind of reflexive connection between culturally and temporally specific beliefs and practices with very un universally recognizable human experiences. So thank you for that, Tom. I know, mic mic'd up like this, I feel like I should be teaching my World War II survey or, so, uh, uh, or, or, some, or something right now. Um, in a rational world of describing Tom's, uh, Tom's scholarship, I should probably have begun by a deep and comparative reading in, of, of Tom's quite substantial scholarship. Unfortunately, Tom's um, scholarship is quite substantial and the pile was really big. Egg, egg, and, and you know, rather than going through it page by page and you know, doing the work that Michael Clinton actually did do of going through it page by page, page I preferred you know, to take a different approach because I'm fundamentally lazy, hence I became a professor, but also you know, because as I think it's important to you know, understand how Tom Kesselman, the mentor, and Tom Kesselman, the research professor, uh, overlap. As has already been noted, uh, Tom is remarkable for the fact that he trained a series of us historians, almost none of whom actually do what, uh, what Tom does. Uh, I take this as a tribute uh, to Tom's fundamentally generous nature, uh, that he was willing to take on people uh, whom he, th he thought uh, uh, were, I mean, perhaps this also raises questions about his judgment, and, but whom he thought were, you know, he thought were uh, you know, bright and good people who could do good work, even if it would require a lot of work of Tom, uh, on Tom's part, to be able to, in, you know, to engage in all the subfields that his students were working in that weren't uh, your own. Um, and so sometimes it can be hard to look at uh, the group of Tom Kesselman students, the people's well, you know, sitting up here and the people who, you know, might have connected via Skype uh, if, if things had gone better and see us as a group. You know, because you can, you know, honestly ask questions. How is the University of saint Joseph the same as the French general staff? Uh, how, you know, how, you know, how are Protestants in the Languedoc, how do, they, you know, how do they fit in with 20th century French peasant unions and, and, and agricultural reform under the Fourth Republic? Uh, but when you start looking at, at how Tom writes, how Tom thinks, and then you start looking in the work that we produce, you start to see that there is, in fact, such a thing as a Tom Kesselman method uh, in research. Uh, 
It's an approach to scholarship, an approach to, to, you know, to topics you know, that takes real people seriously as members of big institutions. And when she, uh, when, uh, uh, when Sheila Nov uh, Novitsky, I still want to call, uh, call her Sheila Rudy sometimes, uh, and, and when Sheila Novitsky is working, on, uh, is looking at, pe at, at agricultural peasant organizations, and she's not, uh, she's not looking at it from the perspective only uh, of the political maneuverings of senior leaders making deals ills, ills in Paris, but you see a sense of real people struggling in to come to grips with the changes of post-war France through these organizations. And when you look at pacifists yes, in early 20th century France, you see not, you know, not a, a, you know, a small cabal of people trying to plot out you know, how they're going to run, you know, run a specific press campaign, how they're going to try and pressure a minister. You know, you see a group of fundamentally decent people faced, faced, faced with the world they cannot fully control, that they, cannot, they feel they cannot understand anymore, struggling and to make sense of it and to, and, and, and to exert their life experience against this impersonal world, building in organizations, building a community as they try to do it. And when you look in Tom's scholarship, that's what you see. A, a, when, Tom when Tom was starting out, you could say of European religious history that it was an isolated subfield in some ways. And most damning of all, you could say it was isolated in no small part by the work of too many of its own practitioners. I say this as a military historian. Both of these are things I know very well from my own work, an isolated subfield, too often isolated because people like me stop talking to everybody else in the academy with our scholarship. Uh, and so it may not make a lot of sense for uh, someone who ends up as a military historian of the 20th century to be learning from a religious historian of the 19th century, but in many ways, Tom was exactly the person I needed to learn from with exactly the approach to scholarship that I need and that my field today badly needs to reintegrate with all the other people sitting in this room um, right now. Because when you look at how Tom talked and looked at the Catholic Church in the 19th century, eh, in many ways, is eh, Tom challenged the, the entire approach that people had taken for, for generations. And instead of a Catholic church defined by its priests and bishops, you know, codified in, in dogma, decided, in, you know, decided by councils of, uh, councils of old men in foreign countries, instead of an organization defined by bricks and mortar and that Amazing, amazing French, very gray, very drab stone that was all that was left after the Reformation. Instead of that antiseptic temple, Tom Kesselman substituted a vision of the Catholic Church that was based, based, based in people in the homes, hearts, and country you know, and town squares of people all over France. In some ways, you could say Tom took uh, the Church of Benedict and substituted the Church of Pope Francis in its place. And in today's world, that's about the, uh, the most exciting praise you can give uh, to a historian of Catholicism, I believe. Uh, but, uh, but I mean this in all seriousness. As when you look at miracles and prophecies, when you look at death and the afterlife, uh, what you see is a Catholic church uh, in which it's the infrastructure of the church, which had before been the center of study, the, pla you know, the place of worship, uh, 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 the curé, uh, the bishop, the archbishop, they're there. They're part of the institution. But the life of that institution are people who farm for a living, people oh, who, make, who make cloth for a living, and pe uh, people who work in a factory uh, for a living. And it's a church made up of them. Um, not just their daily life, but their, spirit, their spiritual life, their day-to-day -day connections to each other through this institution. And 
that helped to redefine what French religious history was. As it helped to begin to move this, to move his subfield into an er area, you know, into new ground, so that by the, uh, you know, by the middle of Tom's career, you know, he could, and I remember you saying this as confidently, you say, that you had begun to have to change the way you wrote introductions to religious history, that you could no longer, as you had when you begun, start by saying, too often is this field ignored by scholars, because it had become a field you know, that any serious historian of France had to take seriously. You could no longer study France and simply say, yeah, well, you know, you have the revolution and some Jansenists running around back then, and, and then you've got de-Christianization and the Dreyfus Affair and, and you know, Notre Dame's a fabulous tourist attraction. And Tom, you know, Tom helped to change, change the way the entire field engaged with religion. And, and he did that at, not by abandoning in the structure of the church or the dogma uh, or how church dogma evolved. He did it by shifting the focus of how you study those things into everyday life uh, and not segregating that off. So the church becomes a seamless organization and with, uh, with officials, with buildings, but also with public spaces inhabited by people attached to the church. You know, you know, the church moves into daily, into daily life, a daily life where workmen will carry a miraculous medal well, as, you know, as testament to their faith and testament uh, to their uh, fears of, of, in, of the industrial economy uh, that, they've that they've become a part of and from which they seek protection even as they get sustenance from it. As a military historian, this is an exciting way to think about how to change the way you study structures. And I see it in my own work. Uh, starting with a dissertation that was supposed to be, if, well, honestly, I don't know what the heck it was supposed to be about. It was supposed to draw from the French army archive because as everyone was sure there was a dissertation in there someplace. Uh, Starting with a dissertation that was supposed to be about grand strategy and education and, and the integration of chemical weapons into, the, into French military ideas, as it evolves step by step you know, in ways that you know, Tom probably he may not have even noticed all of his own influence over, into a work centered uh, on the people who worked for and in the army. Uh, which sought to challenge, uh, which seeks to challenge and the, exclusive, the exclusivity of men in uniform to military history, which recognizes that, there, uh, that during the great wars there were hundreds of thousands of men and women not wearing uniforms who were a part of these institutions. And as I was making this transition in my own work, I didn't realize just how big a debt that owes to Tom's method of studying in religion and in modern France. And, but I don't think it's an accident that a historian who starts out looking at the general staff have, have, and ends up, up looking in at the 300,000 women manning the French army whilst being denied the right to join it or vote during the First World War is trained by a man and who reimagined the Catholic Church uh, uh, reimagine the Catholic Church in a way that's centered uh, uh, on family commemoration and, and that's, uh, that, uh, that's centered on who is, a, who is allowed to participate uh, in services. Is, so when you, uh, when you think about you know, Tom's scholarly impact, uh, it includes his own work, but it also includes a method of history a, that he championed without ever once telling me he did. And, and until this lecture, you know, until this little talk, I'd never tried to sum up Tom Kesselman's approach to history. A, because Tom himself has resolutely a, tried to avoid admitting that he has an approach to history. I remember him um, um, loudly declaring that he was proudly under-theorized uh, in his own work. 
uh, which in some ways is true, you know, but, you know, but in other ways hides. It's, it's a running theme throughout his, you know, the running themes throughout your work, uh, in which you may not have had a theory, but you had a keen understanding in, of what matters in daily life to people and how that impacts you know, the institutions and that, the, that they're a part of. of. And so that is what a military historian learned and from studying 19th century religious history. Thank you, Mike, Andrew, Jamie, and Sammy. I just wanted to mention that Tom has uh, four other doctoral students who, as, uh, as we said, some of whom were not able to travel here. Sheila Nowinski, who finished in 2012, Troy Fay in 2003, and Sophie LaChapelle in 2002. He also has a student in progress, Sean Phillips, who's in the Palatine Seminary right now, and he's actually in his novitiate, so he couldn't, uh, he's forbidden from leaving the seminary, and he was the one we were trying to Skype in, but even that um, didn't didn't work so well. And I'd just like to take a minute, inevitably at these events we privilege our, the doctoral students, or the ones that you're in, in touch with, but let's just pause and think for a second about a man who spent 37 years on the faculty of the University of Notre Dame in the history department, that's 74 semesters, give or take a few sabbaticals. Um, what was the teaching load back in 1979? Uh, it was uh, three, three. Okay. Uh, Okay, I see the dean listening uh, eagerly to hear, hear what this was. Yeah. <laughs> but to think of all those students, uh, the undergraduates that Tom touched um, throughout the years and that he taught, um, it's difficult to gather them in, in a space, but if we could just imagine for a minute, and his, his manifest gifts as a teacher, and, uh, which, is, which they've expressed, um, but I think uh, came to life even more in the undergraduate classroom. So I'd just like to mention them. We have some time now just for, um, some conversation. Uh, you can ask some of the questions, some of the tantalizing things that, that they hinted at that we might want to know about Tom, uh, Tom Kesselman, um, or uh, your own reflections. So we have a microphone available, and I'd just like to invite anybody to um, ask a question of our panelists or to offer a reflection before we hear uh, briefly from Tom himself. Um, yeah, I'm Dan Hobbins. I'm a colleague of Tom's in the history department, and I'm a former student of Tom's as well. His, uh, his seminar on uh, religion and society in early modern Europe. I'm a medieval historian, but I took this in, I think, 1998, maybe, or 97, um, with a couple of your doctoral students whom I remember quite well, uh, Sophie Le Chapelle and Troy Fay. Um, and uh, as a medievalist, we actually, there was a, a sort of, we had an early modernist on the faculty at that time, but he was often not there. Um, and so it was a, a relief, actually, that Tom taught that course uh, for someone who was a late medievalist and actually needed a, to kind of branch into the early modern period. So, um, And Tom was very sensitive to the, I, there was another medievalist, David Mengel, uh, whom Tom remembers quite well, I know. and. Um, and we both uh, enjoyed that course very much, very much indeed. And as uh, uh, and Tom's generosity, it's a theme that I that resonates with me. The uh, our panelists have mentioned, I think every one of them, and his intellectual generosity in reaching out to medievalists. And um, uh, I learned as much in that course as I did for many of my medieval professors. Um, but I also wanted to mention that after that course, then when I was having a bit of a crisis, I think, kind of shift moving from um, coursework into the dissertation and just a, a bit of a crisis of confidence, you might say, um, involving some various things that were, I needed a kind of pastoral ear, and it was to Tom that I turned, not to any of my, uh, uh, to my medievalist mentors. 
And then when I became a faculty member at uh, Ohio State and I was working, I was uh, trying to figure out how to manage graduate students for a Western Civ survey, uh, I just was beating my head against the wall and so I just picked up the phone and called Tom and we have a nice, had a nice conversation. Uh, so all these things that, that you've heard I think are absolutely true and I just wanted to say that. Thanks, Tom. I'm my father's daughter. <laughs> it was so nice to hear uh, some of your students talk about the lessons that you taught them over the years. And um, uh, me and my friends and my husband love to talk about how no matter where you are, there's a history lesson and sort of a, a five-point lecture. And you can kind of see it coming. You can feel him building up for it. But it's actually, over the years, I have a lot of really happy memories of um, Wherever we are, my dad being able to find the history and the story there. And I remember going to Boston in first grade and uh, dad taking us to all of the old cemeteries and keeping me entertained by telling me to find the <laughs> oldest tombstone I could. Uh, and I remember traveling to Oaxaca when I was in probably fifth grade and um, keeping me entertained at the Catholic churches, the various Catholic churches of <laughs> every church every single Catholic church. <laughs> um, and you uh, really teaching me about um, the ways in which Catholicism sort of melded with local indigenous religions and teaching me about all the ex photos and the images of um, miracles happening with families in Oaxaca. And, um, you know, these are, I have so many memories like that uh, of the way, you know, you sort of taught me about history in my everyday life, and I really appreciate it, and I really love you. Wow. <laughs> I'm also the only one of my siblings who's here, so. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I thought she was going to say that you're like a second father. <laughs> uh, so I'm Margaret Meserve. Uh, I joined the department in 2003 uh, as a very young assistant professor, and one of my earliest recollections of Tom is that in those years, senior faculty were assigned to come and visit all the classes of the junior uh, professors as we were to kind of check up on our teaching and see how it was going. And I was very nervous about the prospect of being visited. Um, and I knew Tom was going to come. I sent him the syllabus. Um, and then I got even more nervous when the day that he picked, this was a course on early modern Rome, uh, and the day that he picked was a day when we were going to have a discussion. And I thought to myself, that's always a little tricky to get, you know, a whole room full of people going on a discussion. And now I'm going to have someone watch me do it. And then I got even more nervous when I realized that the text under discussion was uh, a French text. It was Montaigne's uh, journal of his visit to trip through, journey through Italy. And so then I thought, I'm really kind of asking for it at this point. Um, and so the day arrived and the students all came and we talked for about 10 minutes about the text and then I divided them up into groups and asked them to discuss. And I thought, well, now what on earth is Tom going to do while they are all uh, getting their, their, their stories straight? And I looked up to the back of the room and Tom had joined one of the groups um, and was very kind of pointedly gesturing and leafing through the text and pointing things out. Um, and so I was very grateful for his uh, game attitude. And then as we started in on, you know, getting the different groups to report and say what they had done, I looked up and whenever the conversation lagged, Tom's hand would go up. <laughs> <laughs> and he would say, well, I have another thing that I want to add to this discussion. Um, and really, in an incredibly generous way, uh, he ended up helping me run that class, um, but he embraced the role of being a student in the back row um, with complete gusto and generosity. So I'm very grateful to that, for that. And um, I think pretty much any time I ever bumped into Tom in the hallway and mentioned what I was teaching uh, or where a particular class was going, he would have a recommendation of a book um, that he had recently read that was somehow relevant. Often he would run back into his office and grab it and give it to me and say, try this. Um, and those choices were always 
uh, incredibly um, appropriate and kind of spot on and, and in many cases made the class uh, a, a, what a, you know, a, a success. So for your constant generosity um, with, the, with the questions and with the, the suggestions uh, of what makes good history, I'm, I'm tremendously grateful. Thank you, Tom. My name is Dan Graff. I'm also a colleague of Tom's. And uh, I'm going to stay seated because I can tell I'm going to get emotional about this. And I don't want to fall on John Coleman. Um, Tom was uh, amongst the committee. He was on the committee that hired me in 2001. Uh, and I'm so grateful that I got to work with Tom for so many years, uh, mostly on the undergraduate program, because I was director of undergraduate studies uh, for most of my, my time here for the department. Um, Tom was interim chair my first year here, so John McGreevy will be interested in hearing this. This is the first time I learned um, the verb to punt used not in a football context, <laughs> because Tom was simply serving as one year until John McGreevy, uh, who, had, who had agreed to become chair, uh, was going to return in a year. And I knew I had come to a football school, but um, I wasn't uh, ready for, for the generous use of that term repeatedly. <laughs> We're going to punt on that one. Uh, let's go ahead and punt on this. Uh, McGreevy can deal with it. So he did use that a lot, uh, but honestly, Tom is not someone who uh, punts important things down the road, and I would agree in speaking about his generosity, his decency, his sense of humor, his humility. Um, but as a director of undergraduate studies, I mean, he was a wonderful mentor simply in showing that uh, what mattered most was the education of students and that he as chair set the tone in that, even in that one year. Uh, but for you know, anybody who's tried to wrestle with faculty over uh, course times and uh, service obligations and, and teaching different levels of students uh, knows that it can be a challenge. Um, Jake Lundberg is quite aware of that. Um, but Tom Kasselman was someone who, every semester when we talked about what do you, what do you want to teach next semester, his initial answer was always, where do you need me? What do you need me to teach? Do you need me to teach a first year survey? Do you need me to teach a seminar? Do you need me to teach the history workshop, the introductory course for majors? Do you need me to teach a research capstone? Do you need me to teach the honors students? Um, I'll teach my field too if you want, but do you need me to teach these other things? Uh, and that was the, the standard by which Tom operated with the undergraduate program. He always has attempted to come to undergraduate events, dinners scheduled, uh, a history honors program events and the like. And I think uh, Tom's method of interacting with the department, with faculty and with students has really rubbed off on others. He, he might be similarly to the way Andrew says he doesn't define himself or declare his field. He also doesn't declare himself a wonderful mentor of students uh, or faculty, but he is really a mentor of faculty too in terms of how to behave, how to engage, how to care for others. And I think that's why people like Margaret Meserve and John Coleman and Patrick uh, Griffin and others in this room, Rebecca McKenna, they would say things to me after Tom did like, where do you need me to teach? What do you need from me? Which, you know, that was Tom Kasselman's legacy rubbing off even while he was here. So uh, the, the one thing I will say that I won't miss um, when Tom retires, although his, he's, he's, he hasn't done this a lot lately, uh, but he used to red bait me regularly uh, as, a, as a labor historian and as someone who would constantly try to engage him on questions of social justice, perhaps. Um, but I really now realize that as sort of the, the way people have been talking about this is that you yourself you are anxious about your own proclivities towards not just your humility, but your, your generosity and concern for others. Uh, you're a leveler at heart, Tom. And I think that the way that you treat other people and, and the way that your, your scholarship is informed by that, the sort of concern for ordinary people, uh, their beliefs, right, their organizations, uh, their struggles, um, I guess now I'm glad that I was red baited by you. So thanks, Tom. <laughs> Yeah. 
Tom, could we? Oh, Rory, go ahead. No, go ahead. Red baiting, you know. Uh, Joe Stalin was asked by Pravda, you know, what was the emblematic characteristic of the Russian people, and he instantly answered, it's gaiety. Uh, and when I think of Tom, what I think about is enthusiasm. Enthusiasm. I think it's often the case, or can be the case, and especially coming, I suppose, from an Anglo-Hibernian background in, as a historian, where we sort of pride ourselves in some respects in, in our amateurishness in some respects, that sometimes we can get sniffy and think that a certain professionalization that occurs on this side of the Atlantic in some way leads to a, a bureaucratization or a, a losing of charisma or something like that. And I have to say that it, it was my interactions with Tom, above all else, that proved to me how wrong this is, but specifically, in uh, the case of Tom. It's so wonderful to meet somebody who's so thoroughly professionalized and yet so thoroughly enthusiastic. And I, I think it was Camus said that it was the characteristic of the German people that they, uh, the thing that excites them is ideas. <laughs> um, and it's strange that we have a French historian who is being so thoroughly and consistently Germanic. He's so excited by ideas, he's so excited by what ideas can do, and I've always valued that. There is that old, I, su I suppose, proverb which goes, uh, or motto, a thing of beauty is a joy forever. But I think when I look at Tom, you know, it's a thing of duty that's a boy forever. <laughs> Thanks, sir. Tom has assured me that his comments will be brief, and I know he's not lying because he knows there's a reception after this uh, with wine and cheese. So uh, they will definitely be brief. And of yeah. course, uh, we can continue the conversation informally over that. Yeah. Thanks, Kathy. You, you stole my line. Uh, I, I, I've gotten a lot of credit over the years, and, and we heard about this uh, tonight uh, also, that I like to ask questions. I, I don't like that long silence, it makes me nervous. Uh, and uh, so, uh, but, but I, I, it should be said that uh, I enjoy going to talks and I enjoy uh, asking questions, uh, but I also very much enjoy the wine that, and, and the conversation that all this follows them. As Claudia says, I live to schmooze. <laughs> Uh, so anyway, uh, I'm, mostly what I'm going to do is, is, a, is a series of, of thank yous. And I first need to thank the people who organized this symposium, and that's uh, Kathy Cummings and Michael Clinton, and also uh, Pete Lapsey, whose name uh, I now know how to pronounce it. He has, like myself, uh, an HL. I have a KS, and so we, we, we share that in common. He was a wonderful uh, administrator in getting this all set up and following through on the initiatives that, that uh, Michael and, and, and Kathy established. And so I, I want to thank them them very much. And of course, I want to thank everybody who, 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 who came uh, from Notre Dame, but a special thanks to my students who came from uh, pretty far away. Sammy didn't actually have to come from Africa, but he would have, <laughs> right? Yeah. yeah, oh yeah, sure, sure, right. Um, so uh, I want to thank uh, also uh, Phil and Maureen Gleason for coming down from Chicago. Phil was on the search committee, uh, the, uh, the, I guess the Committee on Appointments and Promotions, which functioned as a search committee at the time when I was hired uh, in, in 1979. Hmm, that's a long time ago. And I told Phil just before that I have just a, a very vivid memory of that, that event. It was so important for me to get this, this wonderful job. And, and Phil was uh, uh, and has been a wonderful supporter of mine throughout my career. And I'm just uh, enormously grateful to him for that. Uh, I want to thank Julie for coming all the way from Philadelphia, representing the family. You can see that she doesn't have uh, anything of the Gesellman personality. 
Uh, she's a shy, retiring, quiet sort, always has been, hard to get her to break out of her shell. Uh, and of course, she knows uh, my students uh, and, uh, uh, from the time that we spent together uh, as, uh, as family, and I'll, I'll talk about that a, a little bit more. Uh, I also uh, need to thank uh, Claudia, who uh, uh, is my, my consistent editor. She's edited my little remarks tonight. I told her to give me a sign if I went on too long. She said, it's your night, you can go on. I said, leave me a sign. Uh, I think anybody who knows me at all knows what I feel about Claudia, so I don't see, need to say anything more about that. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the Kushwa Center. I'm a European historian, and the Kushwa Center has been uh, of central importance in my life here, uh, along with the Department of History and the Nanavik Institute. But the Kushwa, in a way, got me going. Uh, when I got here in 1979, Jay Dolan asked if I would be interested in giving uh, uh, a, a, a presentation, a paper to the Kushwa seminar on the field that was emerging then and that was probably unfortunately known as popular religion, uh, a term that I think we're happily rid of now. Uh, but I said yes, and, and I, I had worked on Marian apparitions in France, and I came across a Marian apparition in Wisconsin that actually was a pretty big thing, 100,000 people from the countryside of uh, Wisconsin showed up at Nisida in 1950, and, and Mary was there too. Um, and so I, I did a paper on that, that then with uh, the collaboration of Stephen Novella uh, got published. And, and th that was really the start of, of a relationship that has just been wonderful for me. It's been a stimulating way for me not to learn a lot of American history, but a lot of what people were saying nicely about me and my method came from my engagement with the, the scholars who came to give those seminars. And so in terms of method, uh, I want to really acknowledge the role of the Kushwa Center and the seminars over the last 35 years that I've attended as really inspiring me to think hard about religion and its connections to the rest of the world. Then about three months ago or so, out of the blue, I got an email from an ethnologist in the University of Amsterdam who said, um, I'm editing a volume on um, uh, Marian piety and politics. Would you be interested in revisiting your essay from 35 years ago? And I said, well, I'm retiring. I guess, yeah. Uh, <laughs> So there's a kind of a nice full circle here. And so in May, Claudia and I are going to get in a car and we're going to go to a pilgrimage at Nasida. The cult is still a, a functioning thing. It seems to be doing pretty well, although you can't, since, since it's easy to make websites, it's hard to know, but I'll, I'll let you know. Uh, but uh, it, I, I, was, I was happy to have something to, to, to continue to allow me to think about, uh, about religious practices and the connections between American and European religion, which, as Kathy said, has been a, a, a theme more and more developed in the Kushwa Center. Um, so uh, I want to then also uh, thank my graduate students. Uh, I have to say, uh, I, I hadn't put my own work into the kind of perspective I heard today. and. I think I, I think I, 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 the nice things are nice, but I actually think they, they got it right in terms of the way I think. And uh, I, I guess I am under theorized, and, and I want to thank them for theorizing my, the, the kind of uh, gritty empiricism that I think may, be, may often mark my work. But I'm so grateful for their comments. Um, uh, I had a, another occasion uh, in, at, the, at the American Historical Association. Uh, there was some overlap. Uh, Michael uh, and Jamie were there, and Sheila Nowinski and Troy Fay were there, and they gave Troy and uh, Michael and Sheila gave papers in which they linked their own current research to my interests. And at the end of the session, a French colleague, Frédéric Gougelot, said, you should be very prude of your students. Uh, and I, and I, and I, in fact, I am enormously proud of my students, and I, I think you understand why, having having heard them uh, uh, talk today uh, about their own approaches to history. So I am just so grateful. I, there, uh, I, I don't know if is Cody Rose still here? 
Uh, did he leave? My under, uh, an undergraduate wandered. Uh, hey, Cody. The undergraduates are represented, Cody. Uh, uh, and and I, I want to say that I've been enormously happy to work with graduate students. Uh, I saw Cody up at St. Joseph's Beach a few weeks ago. He wrote me an, a nice thank you note for the courses I've taught. And uh, I, I want to also say how important it's been, and Kathy mentioned this as well, the undergraduates at Notre Dame are a, a blessing. Uh, so thanks to you uh, for all that you said. Uh, and in, at lunch today and at Denver, I just feel like my graduate students are another family. And uh, I'm very happy to say my children get along. Uh, uh, and that's because they, they cross 25 years. And it's nice to, it's nice to see that, that community. Um, um, I want to also thank Chris Hamlin, uh, who co-directed one of the theses. I don't want to take the credit here, in a way, as much as, as I've been given it. I co-directed Sammy Zaka's thesis uh, with Paul Cobb. And Mike Crow, who isn't here, uh, co-directed Sophie LaChapelle's thesis. Uh, and I know that all of my students would acknowledge the, the, the courses they took from colleagues over the years. I'm thinking especially uh, of Alex Martin currently, uh, but in the past, Doris Bergen and Gary Hamburg. Uh, there was uh, a lot of other colleagues, uh, Asher Kaufman uh, as well. Uh, I think, Asher, weren't you on Sammy's thesis committee? Yeah. So um, the, the department is a collective enterprise, and I have profited from that. And that's really what I want to close with. I want to thank my, my colleagues in the history department and the, the two comments I wanted to make. Uh, I, I was talking about this with Claudia yesterday. I, I've really enjoyed working at Notre Dame. So what's so great about the department, right? And it seems to me there's two things. And, and the first of them is the high level of expectations. I mean, when I got here, uh, you know, Fred Pike would take us assistant professors out to lunch and look us in the eye and say, how is the book coming, fellas? And um, and we, we, the expectation was that we were going to write significant works and, if possible, books. And uh, and um, th there were wonderful resources provided. Uh, ISLA has been a, a wonderful asset to, to the university. I've profited from funds from the Nanavik Institute over the years, and I'm very grateful to, to them as well. Um, but. I, I don't want to put it in a material sense because it seems to me the expectations were that you would continue to think about the past and, and bring it alive in a way that uh, you would bring to your classroom. I think teaching was always a big part of that. So high levels of expectations, but but not a coercive pressure that that I think you, you might find at other institutions. I thought... And I think that the, the, the pressure that is applied from those expectations was, is, is, was just about perfect for, for me uh, uh, over the past years. And the other thing, along with that, was confidence that you could fulfill those expectations. And I'm remembering uh, uh, I, I gave a cloak in to the department a few years ago on uh, the, the book that finally got finished, right? Uh, which will come out next year from Yale. And, and I gave a, a, a presentation on it. And at the end, I said, well, you know, it's coming along. You heard what I'm doing. But it's, you know, it just seems never to end. But I'm still working at it. And Patrick said after that, you know, you're closer than you think. And, and the, he was reassuring about, you're going to finish this. We, we know you're going to finish it. So don't worry. And that was very reassuring to me, and eventually, I actually, I did finish it. So it's not only the expectations uh, and the support, it's also the confidence that, that the department gave me that I actually could do the work <clears throat> that I was interested in doing. So I'm, uh, I, I, Claudia and I have reflected a lot on how lucky we have been to have been at this university for so long. Uh, Claudia's career in international studies and mine in the history department have just given us e enormous satisfaction, given us wonderful friends, and are, are the occasion for an event that I, I just am so grateful to everyone for, for organizing. So thanks to all for coming. And uh, I, uh, Claudia didn't give me a signal, so I, I, I guess we're OK. So thank you very much.
let's go get some red wine. <laughs>